Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word and your truth, O oh Lord. Thank you for your goodness and your grace, Lord. Your grace is sufficient, Lord. Your word is true and sure. In Jesus' name. Use your word tonight, Lord, to develop and to equip leaders for this generation, for this hour, for your purpose and your will. In Jesus' name, teach us to lead and to become leaders. Teach us to become fishers of men. In Jesus' name, praise God, praise God. Amen. I want to welcome everyone uh, this evening, this Thursday evening, uh, for another equipping session. We are going to pick up where we left off uh, last Thursday, and uh, we'll be discussing the same uh, topic. The title of uh, last week's, last Thursday's topic was uh, Don't Drop the Baton. Um, and the subcaption is learning to lead. And so that was part one. This is don't drop the baton, learning to lead, part two. And um, <clears throat> I may uh, reflect on last week's uh, teaching, last week's segment, and kind of pick up from there uh, where we left off. Praise God. Again, welcome to everyone that is tuning in, that, that are joining us here by way of internet. Um, we are glad that you are joining us. I do want to make mention of our schedule. Nothing has changed in terms of uh, the <clears throat> guidelines for allowing uh, uh, public gatherings as far as religious services are concerned, um, those uh, guidelines remain in effect uh, today. Obviously, tomorrow, which is Friday, a uh, statement will be made from the mayor's office, and uh, maybe some things will change. Uh, I don't know to what degree, so we will uh, go according to what we know now. Uh, so please uh, stay tuned by way of email, social media, uh, and things of that nature so you can uh, find out any type of adjustments that may be made, whatever they may be, and we'll try to update you as soon as possible. One thing I do know is that we won't go to a full-fledged service, this uh, gathering this Sunday, uh, uh, our intention uh, at least to, to date, is to allow uh, 10 people to gather here um, outside of our staffing, our media department, our uh, worship leaders, and uh, platform ministry, and so 10 people outside of that, which will uh, be different than what we've done. What we've done is just have the staffing in the building, and so we are able to, outside of staffing, have 10 people. And so, uh, to date, that's what we uh, may do come Sunday, and we'll get into all the details by way of email. I don't want to put anything out until we know what's transpiring. And so, uh, this is where we are, and I am uh, looking forward uh, to um, things opening up more and uh, uh, things easing where we can uh, come together, obviously, with uh, some uh, safe safety guidelines in place uh, to whatever degree uh, that is necessary, and obviously some other uh, guidelines to keep the building clean, sanitized, and uh, as safe as possible. And so we want to do that. But um, I think people are desiring to uh, come together as a body and uh, we're fast making our way uh, towards that and uh, the work that we're doing around here. That way when you get back, uh, you will notice a difference in the sanctuary for sure and in the uh, 
the entrance way, the foyer and the exit uh, as well. And you'll notice those differences immediately. And so, um, and prayerfully some of you who have never been here that you've been watching online, and you are in the Baltimore area, uh, we pray that you would come and, and join us pretty soon as we begin to open up and uh, not just watch from afar, but be a part of what God is doing here in this local assembly and maybe become a part of what God is doing here and our part in the uh, last day of revival and harvest um, and God's preparation uh, for his people. He said he's coming for a bride without spot, blemish, or wrinkle, or any such thing. And so God is preparing a people for himself. And I'm sure you would want to be a part of the bride, a part of the body of Christ. Amen. And uh, regardless of what transpired in your past, maybe past hurts, uh, maybe church hurt, different things you've gone through, no one's perfect. Amen. But you can be part of a church that God will cover every sin, every transgression, all iniquity, as long as we repent, turn to him, look towards him, and have faith in him. And that's what this is all about. Amen. And so tonight's discussion uh, is concerning the church. If you are a part of the church of the living God, and if you are part of this church, and when I mean this church, I'm talking about this particular congregation, Antioch North, um, we are striving uh, to train and equip the people of God for the work of the ministry. The book of Ephesians chapter 4 uh, lets us know that the, uh, the ministry, uh, the leadership Ministry, the oversight ministry is responsible for training, uh, for equipping the saints of God to do the work of God. And it's not just the, uh, the leaders, pastors, uh, prophets, and evangelists that are responsible for doing the work of God. It's the body of Christ as a whole. And so it is our job to, to train you and to teach and equip. And many churches uh, thrive on 95% uh, uh, preaching and exhortation, encouragement, uh, inspiration. And while that is a part of uh, the plan of God as it relates to his church, because everyone should be encouraged and inspired, but you can't live off for inspiration alone. You need equipping and training and preparation and teaching and things of that nature. And uh, Jesus was uh, spoken of as being a teacher more so than being a preacher. Amen. And so the early church was about teaching and training. Jesus said to teach all nations to observe whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even into the end of the earth. And so... It was the responsibility of the leaders of the church to teach, to equip, and to train. And so this particular message is speaking to everyone in the church that you have a place, you have a role, and a responsibility to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, um, to not only to be a witness, but uh, to... Uh, be uh, an example and uh, uh, a leader to lead others. Uh, simply, the word leader in, in basic form is really someone that is uh, leading someone else. Amen. And so you don't necessarily have to be high on the, uh, uh, the, the ladder as far as where your rung is, uh, but Everyone has someone that they are following, someone that they're walking alongside with, and someone that will look towards them to follow them. And so as I discussed last week, it is uh, your responsibility to receive all that you can as far as training and equipping, regardless of 
uh, where you are in God. If you are a babe in Christ, if you are a new uh, believer, uh, you don't have to wait for 10 years to be equipped. We don't have a whole lot of time. Amen. Uh, the Bible talks about a day where the, the, uh, the sowers will overcome the reapers or the reapers will, will, will overcome the sowers. And, and so it's a fast progression. And I believe people will grow rapidly as God is looking for people that are willing to surrender themselves and to give themselves to the kingdom of God, the things of God, so he can use them in this last day. He said he's going to do a, a short work and cut it in righteousness. And so God will, will, will uh, put in you everything that you'll leave space for him to fill. And he will use you to the degree and dimension that you uh, give yourself to him. And so it doesn't matter. Uh, I, it was a couple of months uh, from, from being a, a newborn babe that I was uh, designed to teach and, and, and to uh, teach people uh, what I knew. And so you can do that. As a matter of fact, um, the Bible says of Apollos, is, <laughs> right after he received the new birth experience, he was going about teaching. And, and so uh, you, you can have a quick turnaround. And so those of you who've been in this thing for a while, uh, we need to understand that we, you know, being a leader is not just simply uh, finding a place, a position where people are looking up towards you, looking up to you. Uh, being a leader is actually finding someone that you can lead beyond where they are. And so that is the intent and purpose of this message last uh, week's uh, 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 scripture uh, reference was 2 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit uh, thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. So Paul's response... Paul's uh, command uh, to Timothy was to commit what was taught to him, find faithful men and train them, equip them and teach them so they can teach others also. It's a progression. It's a continuation. It's passing the baton. And so it's like a relay race. And that's what we discussed last week. And so um, if you did not uh, listen or watch that, I would encourage you to go back just so you can have a reference point uh, towards uh, some things that I'm going to be discussing tonight. So this is drop the, don't drop the baton, uh, part two. Learning to lead. Everyone can lead someone. You say, well, I'm not a leader in the church. You don't have to be a leader in the church uh, to learn to lead someone to Jesus. And so the scripture text for tonight is Matthew chapter 16, and I'll be reading verses 21 through 23. That's Matthew 16, 21 through 23. And uh, obviously, uh, the book of Matthew is uh, speaking on the, the ministry of Jesus Christ. Uh, so from that time, uh, forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go into Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and uh, be raised again the third day, verse 22. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee, verse number 23. But he, Jesus, turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of men. I'm going to read that in another translation. From that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, 
and he and that he must be killed on the third day uh, and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and rebuked uh, him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said unto Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Uh, from the onset that may not, and on the surface that may seem like that doesn't have anything to do with the, the topic at hand, but you'll see where I'm going with uh, that particular uh, passage of Scripture. And so as a leader, uh, we need to build something that can outlast us. If you're going to be a leader, you must understand that you need to uh, allow God to use you beyond yourself. You see, a lot of leaders, uh, their primary uh, goal is to uh, become uh, something of importance. Uh, to, to, to many, a leader is someone that is, has reached a certain status in stature. Is something or some, uh, is a position that people look up to. But that is really not what a leader is in Scripture. That may be a leader in the world and a leader's concept in the world. And, 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 and Peter, uh, you know how Peter was. He would blurt out something that was so far from uh, the will and the mind of God, uh, but he wasn't afraid to blurt it out. And, but this particular time, Jesus rebuked Peter, and very strongly, I mind you, I mean, you can't get any of a stronger rebuke than calling somebody a devil. Get, get, get behind me, Satan. You, you, don't, you don't care anything about the things of God. You only care about the things of men. I mean, that was a stern, strong rebuke. Amen. So as a leader, Jesus responsibility was to build or train up men that would outlast his life and his legacy. When we uh, build uh, or when what we build uh, leaves us or leaves off and uh, dies away uh, or, uh, you know, when we retire what we have done fades away right there. We are not a leader, but we are a failure. When your ministry or what God uses you to build outlasts you, that is a part of your legacy. When people can see your handprint and your footprint and uh, your spirit, uh, and, and uh, people uh, that you've equipped and trained, it it carries on like Paul's uh, ministry and, and his anointing and his spirit carried on in the life and ministry of, of, of Timothy as, as uh, Elijah uh, passed on the, the mantle to, to Elisha and that ministry. Uh, it didn't die with Elijah. It, it carried on. It is our responsibility as leaders, as you are learning to lead. Uh, again, I'm talking to everyone that desires to be a disciple of Christ. If you want to be a disciple, you are to look for and look towards someone that you can lead to whatever degree. But the idea is not to become someone of importance, not to become someone of recognition and, and that you've given yourself a name or created a name that people know you now. And it's, that is not the idea of a leader or leadership that, hey, I became someone important and people recognize me and recognize my position. And so when I retire, I will have that under my belt. No, it's not about that. It's when you go on, when you pass on, you leave a legacy because your legacy is living. It's people that you've poured yourself into. You must find someone to pour yourself into. Jesus said, as I 
mentioned and quoted uh, last week. He said, hey, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. And, and he, he uh, found nourishment, spiritual nourishment, and pouring himself into someone else. And there are people, there was a, a Elijah, the Bible told, uh, the Bible speaks of Elijah uh, when the brook dried up. And the raven stopped providing the meat. Uh, God told Elijah to go to the brook and I will feed you there. And I think it was Kidron. And, and he said, you go there and I'm going to have ravens to feed you. And this brook, every, it, 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 there was a famine in the land, but this brook obviously still had water. And he said, you go there and I'm going to provide uh, some water for you. And it had to be a supernatural thing. And But pretty soon that brook would dry up and pretty soon the birds would fly off and maybe to go to a place where there wasn't a famine so they could eat. And, and so all that dried up, all the miraculous and the supernatural dried up and then God said, this is what I want you to do, Elijah. I want you to go, or Elisha, I want you to go. No, I'm sorry, it was Elijah. I want you to go, to, and there will be a woman, a widow woman, who will sustain you. And so sometimes God will send you to people, and they will sustain you. You know what? I, a lot of times in my walk uh, with God, er, even early on, when I began to first start teaching Bible studies and things of that, that nature, it was those Bible studies that I taught, they were sustaining me. You know, you know, we can tap into the Holy Ghost and we can come and church services and, and do all that and come to gatherings. And man, it feels powerful. It feels good. We have worship services. We have praise and worship and the word is going forth. And I'm telling you, you can get energized. You can get encouragement and enthusiastic about all that, but that can only carry you so far. Sooner or later, you're going to need to find someone to give out to. Amen. It always amazes me when I see uh, a, a woman uh, I, I, like my wife. My wife would loves to feed children. She, it's like she gets something out. She may be worn out, tired, and everything else, but then you got a kid that she want to feed off. Man, she just go. I mean, something happens, uh, and, and something happens within her. She it seems like she draws strength from somewhere because she's giving out, and because she's giving out, she's getting something out of it. And so, again, if you uh, desire, amen, to grow in God, you must understand that God has designed it so where you are going to get more satisfaction when not only you receive, but you learn to give. I'm talking about leading people. And so Elijah was told, hey, there's a woman that will sustain you, that will feed you. you, you you've you gotten your nourishment and your strength supernaturally, but there are people that I'm going to lead you to, a person I'm going to lead you to, and when you minister to her, she's going to minister to you. We must understand that when we lead people, when we minister to people, they are a ministry to us. Some leaders, though, they are too focused on the next position more than the next generation. And we need to be focused on the next generation, the, the people after us, not on the next position or the position that we are seeking to get, that we are after. We can't become more concerned about power and authority than we are about people. As a leader, it's not about becoming a pillar in the church. It's about allowing God to use you to affect the lives of people. And so we need to build on things that will outlast us. Pull out, pull into and the best way to do this is to build someone else up. Not build yourself up. Initially, I've seen it. People feel like they call to ministry. 
and they look at how they can ascend. And uh, we, we need to get out of that mentality. And it's not building ourselves up. It's about finding people that we can build up, that we can pull into. Not that these people will come and follow us to worship us or to look at us in, in a certain light. Wow, look at them. No. So they can look at Christ and say, wow, look at him. Look at him. I want to be closer to him. If we lead people towards us, where they see us more than they see the God in us, it's a dangerous thing. So leaders have to learn how to pass the baton of leadership. Pass the baton. If you've never been in a relay race, just, just try it. It's about passing the baton. It's, it, it's amazing. What, what, see, when you're, when you're in a race all by yourself, the only thing you're doing, thinking about is dusting your opponent. All you're thinking about is making sure you are ahead of your opponent. All you're thinking about is making sure you outshine your opponent. You, all you're thinking about is make sure you do everything outside. But when you're in a relay race, you're giving it all you can. But then there's a certain moment your focus is not on giving all you can. As a matter of fact, in many cases, you have to kind of slow up or, or, or change stride just to make sure the whole focus is you passing the baton to the next person that's going to run the next leg. And when you step aside, you're cheering them on, go, go. As a matter of fact, do better than I did. I mean, catch up ground and make up ground, do everything. And your whole focus is, is passing the baton and seeing your successor outdo you. A true leader is focused on people that they are leading outdoing them. I'm telling you, a horrible leader is looking over their shoulder to make sure no one gets ahead of them. No one outdoes them. In our opening scripture, Jesus was predicting his death. He told his disciples that he had to go away. I mean, that's, 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 that was a sad moment. Imagine three and a half years, three and a half years. Well, he probably didn't, but maybe three years uh, where, where he, uh, you know, he ministered for, for three and a half, his ministry. So a little over three years, he was with them. He was uh, night and day. He was investing in them. He, he uh, told his disciples, hey, I, I'm going to go away. I mean, that was a sad. I mean, they witnessed him do so many miracles and walk on water and, you know, just crazy stuff. When he told them this, hey, I, I, brothers, I'm, I'm about to leave. There was some resistance. And naturally, Peter would resist the most. He didn't want to see Jesus to leave, and that's understandable. He built this very unique uh, relationship and friendship with Jesus and Jesus. And Peter became, hear me now, he became too comfortable with the way things were. You see, if you are going to fulfill uh, an area or the next level uh, that God has for you in this leadership uh, uh, chain, you must understand that you are, there will be changes. It will be changes in relationships and there will be adjustments that will have to be made and, and sometimes people get too comfortable and I've had situations where, you know, your people are being trained and groomed for, 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 for care group ministry and people don't want to, you know, sp don't split up my group. No, don't take them out. You know when something is growing because there's always changes. When my, my wife has a plant or we, we grow hostas or whatever, you know the hostas is growing when you take the hostas, you pull it up, you, you separate it, and you, and you plant some of that somewhere else, and that hostas grow big, 
And then the other thing just keep growing, and you continue to do that. And you make room for growth. It, 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 things change. And we, we need to understand that, that um, we, 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 while it's okay to get comfortable with way, the way things are, you can't get too comfortable because growth always demands room for someone else and something else. And when you get too attached to a relationship and the way things are, not understanding that this is temporary, uh, you need to understand leadership uh, is temporary or places in leadership is very temporary because uh, that leader will go on to other areas and other things as we train others and then others are training others and it's a, a progression, it's a continuation. It's perpetual. Roles will be different, redefined, and redetermined. And Peter couldn't grasp that. He had to readjust. Well, you're going away. No, we just got comfortable with this. That can't be. Peter, it is more expedient that I go away. Because when I go away, some things are going to happen that can't happen until I go away, until the dynamics change. And that's part of growth, and to see dynamics change. And, and that's one thing about Antioch, the Apostolic Church, and Antioch North all as well, is that there's always changes. People say, man, as soon as we, we get comfortable here, things are changing. That's a good thing. That's a good sign. And so the disciples were about to get a, another lesson in leadership, and that was for them to start leading. Everything Jesus taught them for those three and a half years were about to be put into practice. And they were going to be placed on the spot. The disciples had to first be led, as I discussed last week, before they could lead. They had to first be led. They took three and a half years learning to lead. Now, they were being trained. They were being used. They went out. The Bible says as they taught. They went to pre preach. They healed the sick. They cast out devils. Everything that Jesus did in those three and a half years, they did also in following him. And so they had some practice. Amen. They started out as disciples and then they became apostles. Now, the problem I see a lot of times in the church is that too many people want to start out leading when they haven't been led or allowed someone to lead them. Quite frankly, I, it's sad to say that there are some people in the church that I pastor, in the congregation that I pastor, I will never lead them. I will never pastor them. Am I, am, am I the pastor of the church? Do they call me pastor? Yes, but they won't let me lead them. You can't be a great leader. Or you will never become a great leader unless you learn to become a great follower. If you are a lousy follower, I guarantee you, you will be a lousy leader. Oh, my God. I don't care how well you operate in, in, in a uh, home Bible study. I don't care how well you know the Bible and everything else. I'm going to tell you what. You will, be, you will become a lousy teacher. You may think you all that in a bag of chips. You become a lousy leader if you're a lousy follower. You can become a great leader if you learn how to become a great follower. Jesus didn't leave behind a program, building program. Jesus left behind people. He didn't leave behind, okay, he did say, upon this rock, I'm going to build my church. <laughs> but he left behind people. That was the church, people. And we have to understand that we're in the people business. 
And so we need to pour into people. It's nice to do things in the building and do things related to the building uh, and especially to do things concerning the kingdom. But you don't have a kingdom, <laughs> meaning king's dominion, unless you have people in the kingdom. Now you can't have a kingdom without people. You may have land, you may have a mass of land, but you can't have a kingdom without people. And so you need people. And so even when you are focused on the kingdom, I guarantee you, you're focused on people. Because the kingdom of God is about people. So Jesus left behind not a program, not a building, not a building program, not some institution. He left behind leaders that will, that will train and equip other leaders and that would feed the church of the living God lambs and sheep that they would grow and develop and to continue on until Jesus would come back, until he comes back. And it's a perpetual thing until he gets back. And I believe, again, as I've spoken of last week, that we're on that last leg of the race. We're not the last, but there are, there's a generation behind us that we need to pet. We can't just say, oh, let it die right here. Oh, the devil would want it to die right here. He would want it to snuff it out right here because the greatest work that God desires to do in the last day, he would want that silence and snuffed out. He would want the baton dropped before the end of the race. I don't care how well we've done and how well your team have done up until just before the end. You may have been in first place, but if you drop the baton before the end of the race, guess what? You're disqualified. You lose out. And so we have to pass it on to the very end. Finding the next leaders, the next group of leaders. So the legacy of a a true leader is the reproduction of other leaders. You need to be looking. You need to be on God. You need to be watching. You need to be vigilant. You need to be a watchman on the wall, eyes on the field, equipping, training, or just simply teaching, uh, witnessing, finding someone that will follow you. Jesus' legacy was all about leaders, developing leaders, producing leaders, reproducing himself. That was his, his legacy. So leadership, uh, leadership legacy is reproducing more leaders. That's what it's all about, leaving behind leaders. Jesus took disciples, followers, and again, he turned them into disciples or apostles which were leaders. So disciples are followers, those that follow Christ. And so there are a lot of you, a lot of us, we are disciples, we call ourselves disciples. Amen. And so we are followers. A disciple is a follower. Follow me as I follow Christ. But then we need to become leaders. Leaders. Jesus identified his leaders as successors to carry on his work, his work. He was a mentor and a trainer. He trained people. He trained his replacement. I'm saying this to you who are aspiring for leadership, or those of you who are already in leadership. What, what are you, what is your main goal? Are you looking for people to do your job? I tell you that for sure. Now, see that you can take that one or two ways. You know, I don't want anyone to do my job. I, I suppose to do my own job. No, you, I suppose to do my job, but I need to um, delegate and find people. I need to, to do my job. In other words, replacement. Uh, someone to take my place because uh, there's always there are, there are always areas that God will take us to, other dimensions and and areas and ministry that if we just stay uh, in the position and place that we're in, we won't go into those things. So we always need to find people 
to do what we're doing, amen, uh, so we can do other things. And so we can also leave behind uh, someone that will fill that void if and when we go on to something else. But if we hold this place so dear, God can not take us to other places in ministry and in the kingdom because we haven't uh, trained anyone in that area because we, we, we're hoarding, we're protecting, or we are uh, what you would call, um, uh, I forget the word, where you, you, you're pretty much, you're trying to keep everyone else uh, kind of aggressive and you don't want anybody around that and you're protecting your, your, your space and you're being uh, um, uh, dominant and you don't want anybody and you're, and you're surrounded and, and, and you, you're making sure, no, no, this is mine. No, the thing is, is you need to allow people to come in and learn what you're doing because that's the only way you can be, for lack of better terms, elevated or positioned to another place in ministry that God would call you for. But, you know, again, we have too many people that are, the word I was looking for was territorial. So this is my territory. This is my space. And you can't come in this space. This is, this is my job. This is my domain. This is my area. See, Jesus didn't do that. Jesus said, hey, this is my, I've, I've come to do this work, but I'm going to train you, 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 and you to do this job that I'm doing. And so I can go on to other things. You must always have that mentality and mindset that before I go on to something else, I'm going to make sure I build up and train up and equip and teach someone else what I'm doing. I'm going to show them everything I know. That's a leader. That's a good leader. That's a great leader. Jesus' job was to lay the foundation. It was the apostles' job to take Jesus' ministry further than he did. Jesus didn't spend a whole lot of time outside of Galilee and uh, Jerusalem and Samaria. He, he stayed in the, the, the region of Galilee. Uh, a lot of his ministry, he traveled uh, southward and to Jerusalem and those surrounding cities of Bethany and, and those areas. And uh, he didn't go too much farther than that made his way sojourn back to the region of Galilee north and he would uh, go through Samaria as we found in John chapter 4 but he limited his ministry to the Jews very seldomly did he minister or speak to or communicate to people outside of the Jewish faith and nationality and when he did it was so unorthodox and so strange that he was looked on profoundly like what are you doing namely the woman at the well the Syrophoenician woman when he spoke well of the Roman centurion who was a man of great faith uh, and those things rocked the uh, Jewish people because it was out of the norm because Jesus ministry was to the Jews but Jesus' ministry wasn't just to the Jews because he trained and equipped apostles who would go beyond and further than Jesus' foundation. And he, they were able to take the foundation and move the foundation forward. So the successor's job was to move things forward and to spread beyond where the predecessor uh, went to. Amen. So leadership is, is, is not a sprint. It's, it's a relay race. It's, it, you know, you, you take your time in leadership. You don't get there overnight. It's, 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 it's a relay, relay race of passing, again, the baton on to the, the next person, the next, the next leader, the next person in line. And it is our job and responsibility to find the next person in line. The, the moment you stop thinking like that is when you stop thinking like a leader 
And the moment you stop thinking like a leader, you'll stop acting like a leader. So the appropriate thinking of a leader is building others up to succeed, not building yourself up to lead. I'm going to say that one again. The appropriate thinking of leadership is building others up to succeed, not building yourself up to lead. So, you, you know, oh, I got to learn this and I got to so I can learn how to lead. You learn how to lead by building up others to succeed. It's a simple process. Unfortunately, again, it's not how uh, many leaders operate. And it's sad to say that that's, it's not how people in the church operate. Unfortunately, it's a doggy dog world. It shouldn't be a doggy dog church. Against uh, leadership is very seasonal. Places of leadership are seasonal. And so what you are and what you're doing currently in this season, you must understand that it's temporary more than likely. And you must learn how to adapt to the changes. You can't get too comfortable in a certain situation, environment, relationships, because as you grow, as people grow, relationships change. They take on new shape. And that, again, shows growth. Understanding that leadership is seasonal is sometimes a hard lesson to grasp. It's true. You see someone go on to other things. It, 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 it's, it's hard to, to grasp, to, to know that. I, I can remember uh, when we as a congregation, uh, as uh, we, we, we started venturing out, uh, we obviously, the daughter works were in full uh, bloom in terms of uh, we had, I forget, 20-something daughter works at Antioch, the Apostolic Church, and, and they uh, functioned in, in a certain manner. And uh, on Sunday mornings, and we all came together on Sunday nights and on Thursdays, and we would meet uh, for a report, uh, for meeting, and uh, the structure of Antioch uh, adapted and uh, changed um, as the uh, uh, as we adapted to what God was doing in positioning and learning and figuring things out and seeing what worked, what didn't work, how things fit in. And I remember when we started going to uh, Sunday evening services, I didn't know whether I was, I, I, I was really uncomfortable. I was, I didn't, I didn't really think that I was in a place that, uh, quite frankly, I was ready for that, uh, ministering, leading, and uh, doing that on Sunday morning and Sunday evening, and, and more so than anything, I developed over those years that comfort level of being able to come back or go back home to at the morning service. You know, it was an out, really, Sunday morning was an outreach thing. Um, you reach out in that community, in that area, as a daughter work, and, and things of that nature, and, and the mentality wasn't that of a, a, a congregation, a church, so to speak, and, uh, and, and it was starting to take shape. And I, I, I was like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm so used to going on Sunday evenings, going back, and, and how is this thing going to work? And, and, and I, I became so, I didn't want to see it die. I didn't want to see Jesus go like Peter. 
And so it, it, I, it, I was in a tough place, and it's like, I don't know about this. And then it was okay Sunday mornings, Sunday evenings, and now on Thursdays. And maybe uh, once a month we'll go down there, and, and that changed. I was like, oh, my goodness, can we do this? Are we ready for this? How are the people going to respond? And now we are here for the most part other than Antioch United Services. But God knew and he was preparing me. And my point is, again, is that you cannot become so comfortable with relationships and how things are because the dynamics will change as God is developing. Because, again, leadership is seasonal. The predecessor, the pre, uh, predecessor has to pass the baton to the successor. And, and, and the successor must understand your relationship is about to pass or about to change. I'm sure Joshua didn't want to see Moses leave. Moses took Joshua up to that mountain said, Joshua, I'm about to pass the baton. I can imagine Joshua was sad. He wasn't thinking about, yes, I'm going to be the man now. <laughs> everybody's going to have to listen to me. I'm going to go up to the mountain now, and everybody's going to look at me. I, I don't believe that was uh, Joshua's attitude. I don't believe Joshua was looking at uh, uh, himself and, and, and uh, how he was going to be the, the head honcho and everything else. I believe Joshua, just like Peter, was sad to see his mentor, his leader, the one that trained him, was about to pass on and pass the baton. While it was exciting to take the baton, it was also a challenge. Can I tell each and every one of you that it's always a challenge to take that next place in leadership? I know a lot of times we don't think, we don't feel, at least we shouldn't anyway, that, that we are uh, capable of going to that next place. I believe that should be a side of us. While we should have some, um, some confidence in the God in us, there should be something in us that where you get those little butterflies. Not that you're trusting yourself, but hey, am I ready for this? See, oh, I'm, I'm just going to tell you like this. When I felt like I was ready, yeah, well, well Bishop, I'm just as real. This is not hypothetical. Bishop, uh, what about me? You know, I hear everybody else's name being called. And what about me? See, I thought I was ready. That proved I wasn't ready. With that attitude, with that stinking thinking, I wasn't ready. But when every time where I felt and, and, and thought, you know what, I'm not ready to do this. And I, I'm telling you, I was like, ah, I'm not ready for that. I'm not. Then I get a call, uh, Brother Simpson, or an email, or text. Uh, I got a such and such date and time. For a meeting. Don't tell what the meeting is about. I'm like, oh no, what did I do now? <laughs> oh man, you get that call from, from the pastor or the bishop, and you don't, he doesn't tell you what it's about. He just said, I want to meet with you. First thing you think about is, what did I do now? Well, I can tell you, if you have been in a position of humility and, and humbling yourself and, and, and not elevating yourself beyond you, uh, uh, what you should have, and, and you uh, feel like, you know what, I, I don't deserve what I, where I am, and I, I, I'm not ready for the next place. I'm telling you what, God is about, to, about to, to knock on your door and tell you you're ready. When you think, you you know what, I need to be here, and, and, and they're overlooking me, I'm telling you right now, when you have that attitude, I'm being overlooked. If you think you're being overlooked, you're not ready. I'm going to tell you why you're not ready. Because when you, think you're not, when you think you're being overlooked, you are forgetting the fact that God is in charge. <laughs> and when you think you're being overlooked, you already said man is in charge. See, God sets up one, down another, put down another, and God is in control, and God knows. 
So it was time for Moses to pass the baton, baton to Joshua. And Joshua was ready. Moses' job was to get the Israelites out of Egypt and get them started on their journey. And, and, and Joshua's job was to get the people uh, the rest of the way to the promised land that Moses saw, he envisioned, and everything else. But we know Moses wasn't able to enter. You know, Moses could have felt like, you know what, man, I spent 40 years in Egypt uh, learning uh, uh, how to lead and how to be a, an important person. And then I got put in the desert uh, where God had to deflate me from being so important in the palace and Pharaoh's household, and now I'm in the desert, and uh, now I'm leading sheep. And God spent 40 years working on Moses, showing him a different perspective of leadership. And so you weren't going to lead the people of God based on your Egyptian education on leadership. You had to learn how to lead based on God's education of leadership through humility and being in the desert and learning how to lead sheep. And so Moses learned humility those 40 years. And then God called him and said, Moses, now you're ready. I just took 40 years to, to, to get Egypt, that 40 years of Egypt out of you. So now you can go back and you can lead the people the way I desire for you to lead them. And Moses spent his next 40 years, amen, leading the people of God. And then he got to Mount Nebo and God says, hey, that's it. That's as far as you go. Moses could have felt like, hey, you know, what, what, what's going on? I, I, I gave given my whole life to this. And God said, Moses, I got the man that's going to take it to the next place. Can I tell you that you're never the full package? You're never the full package. God always has somebody else that's ready to take the baton because, again, this is a relay of race. This is a team. This is a church. This is not a one-man show. This is not this, a one-man show. This is not uh, uh, the long ranger before he met Tonto. Amen. And even long ranger needed uh, silver. He needed, uh, he needed uh, Tonto. And um, I don't know, the, and Trigger, I guess that was it. I don't know whether, whatever Tonto's horse and the horse's name was. I, I don't know. But the, he needed, you, you, you can't be a long ranger expecting to get this thing done. Joshua never let go of the vision as a predecessor. Moses was the visionary, but Joshua was the one who was next in line to lead the people. And Moses invested everything he could into Joshua to be the man that would take the people to the next place. And he said, be of good courage. Be strong. And be of good courage. You may not have the same ministry and the same gifting, but the same spirit that was on Moses was also on Joshua. And as Jesus told the disciples, hey, greater works than these shall you do because I go to my Father. You see my works? Greater works than these shall you do. Jesus wanted his disciples to be greater than he was. He expected his disciples to do great works. He wasn't so high and mighty, even as the Savior, even as God manifested in flesh, his goal and desire was for his followers to become leaders and to be greater. Great leaders are not intimidated by their successors. They want their successors to be greater than they are. It takes maturity. Insecure leaders don't want others to be greater than them. But when you know who you are, when you are uh, sure of who you are in God and comfortable in your skin, you want everyone that you lead, everyone that are following you 
to be greater than you are. What a testimony and what a testament to your leadership. Finding people. You know, some things you learn years and years after walking with God. And if, I, if I've learned something after 10 years or 20 years of walking with God, I'm not going to look at somebody who's been walking with God for a year, two years, say, well, nope. I guarantee you, they got to wait today. No, no, I, they don't have to wait today 20 years in this thing. Hopefully, they can learn it a whole lot faster. And that's a, uh, a mark of a good leader is to pour into, to pour into predecessors. If your successor is greater than you, that means you both win. If you are leading someone, teaching someone, witnessing to someone, you want to give them your best. You don't want to say, well, I don't want to give them that. I don't want them to know more than I know. Train people to be greater. Put your DNA on your successes. So both of you going, you don't, you don't want to be like Saul. Saul was so jealous and intimidated by David. He didn't want David, hey, that, that, that cry, you know, he was like, okay, David, you all right, I'll, I'll give you my daughter. You bring in some uh, scalps of the Philistines. Help do my work for me. See, he wanted David to help do the work, but he didn't want David to be great. Once, they, once David came back and says, Saul slain his thousands, but David uh, slain his ten thousands. I mean, say, uh, Saul's head just, you know, kind of did that number, and his eye went up like, oh, no, we can't have that. And as soon as he heard that call, he was all right with, with, with David killing Goliath, killing the giant. He was all right with that because ultimately he was the king and he won the battle even though David was the one that killed the giant. I mean, they, they were looking at David like he was, a little, he was a little kid, little boy, like, okay, man, he got lucky, you know. Beginner's luck. But they was looking at Saul like, Saul, you the king, you the man, we got, this battle is because of your leadership. You put the the, the, your armor on David, even though he didn't carry it on and you gave it to him, he went inside your tent. When he came out of your tent, I don't know what got a hold of that little boy, but he went out there with the slingshot. He hit, the, he hit, I don't know what you told him, Saul, but he hit that giant. The giant fell. He cut off his head. Yes, David won the battle, but Saul, you the man, you the king. Saul didn't have any problem with that. Now David is going out. Saul says, hey, you go do this, kill this many, i give you my daughter, be your bride. Great. Everything was fine until people started recognizing David. Hey, David, 10,000, Saul, 1,000. And something got a hold of Saul. Hey. He's getting a name greater than I am. I can't allow that to happen. And I'm going to tell you like this. I would love to see some of the ministers in this congregation. Amen. Start growing a work. Small group. Bible studies. And that thing grow and flourish. And next thing you know, they have a, uh, uh, a, a place that they're ministering. And, and they run in 500. They run in the thousand. Amen. They souls. Hey, yeah. Hey, I'm not going. Oh, they doing better. Than, hey, you know what? Everything. Every time they succeed, I succeed. It's just the ministry uh, multiplying. I, I, it, it, I'm not going to look at it and be jealous of that. I'm not going to be intimidated by that. See, in a relay race, everyone wins on a team that wins. 
And so we must pass this, uh, the, baton, the baton successfully. Passing the baton successfully. But as a leader, I'm talking to leaders. And again, I'm talking to everyone. 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 As you are walking, developing, and growing in your relationship with God, God is calling you to lead someone. And you must take these principles and these concepts with you and make them a part of you. Jesus picked the right people. He found out, he looked, and hey, Simon, son of Jonah, or son of Jonas, I want you to follow me. Your brother Andrew, yep. I saw him the other day when I was getting baptized, and I want you to follow me. John and James, sons of thunder, I'm going to call. Y'all follow me. But follow me, follow me. Matthew, you're a tax collector, but I want you too. Judas, yeah, I know what you're going to do. Follow me. I need you too. He picked the right people for the right positions, the right things, and ministries and everything else. You must, and I must, look for people. Look for people that are going to succeed, to become our successors, people who are going to become leaders, who you can commit to, people that are going to be committed, and people that you can teach and train that, that will be faithful, and then they will teach other people. And you're not going to find perfect people. And you go look for perfect people, you're not going to find it. The only, t only, the only perfect person you're going to find is Jesus. The apostles, they weren't perfect. The, the disciples, they weren't perfect people, but they were the right people. You can't look at people where they are. You need to look at where God is going to take them. You need to look at potential. And we all have baggage. We all have negative seeds. And we all have things uh, that we're not necessarily proud of. So Jesus saw potential. And we must see the potential in people that we want to lead with and after us. We must see people's potential. Jesus gave the keys to the kingdom. Hey, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. While they were flopping, <laughs> while they were, uh, you know, I mean, right after he gave them gave keys to the kingdom, he called, called Satan, get thee behind me, Satan. I told Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, <laughs> right, right after all that, thou art the rock. Peter, <laughs> I'm going to build my church. And... Here are the keys. Predecessors can't be afraid to surrender their power, position, the keys, as well as their knowledge to their successors. You can't be afraid to give people the keys to the kingdom. There are a few things, as I'm closing, there are some couple of things that are very important for the successors. Things you should know as you learn to lead people and enter into leadership and to grow in leadership. So I'm going to give you some words of successor. There must be te uh, seasons of reflection to look back to see where you've come from, to see the progression of things. There's going to be a season of rejection. So while there's a season of reflection, to see God moving along the way, and that way you don't get too big-headed. You got to remember where you came from, because when all you're looking is ahead and see where you are right now, and you forget where you came from, you're going to treat others with disrespect. You're going to treat others, belittle them like they're nothing, and look down on them like you, you know, like you came down from heaven and not out of the miry clay. 
like you came down from glory and it wasn't that God took you up out of the pit. And so you got to re reflect so you can stay humble. But there will also be seasons of rejection. And you must understand it as a, 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 as a successor that you come in on, and you start, you know, when, when you have people that were ahead of you or people that were, or the people that lead uh, before you or uh, that, 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 uh, that leads, so you got the bishop, that there's going to be seasons where you're going to feel rejected because, or, you know, they're, they're answering to someone else or, you know, uh, small group leaders, for instance, you know, well, I, I, I want to go ask the pastor and you, you can't, you know, you can't be messed up if someone wants to talk to someone else. And, well, I want to go ask uh, Elder Brown and, you know, you, you, you can't. Oh, I want to talk to the bishop. Go right ahead. Email him if you want to. Just do things properly and decently in order. There will also be times of comparison. You must be able to handle that. If you're going to lead people, you're going to have to understand people, will, they're going to compare uh, how you lead to how your predecessor lead or led. And so they'll look. You go into a situation and you lead the person and they used to be in another small group. They're going to, they, they're going to compare you. This, this is just the way human nature is. They're going to compare you to other leaders. And uh, you must understand that because God is going to use that to test you, to see you. You know, God, God, is, God knows how to test us and, and check our motives. Whoa, sorry about that. Out there in TV land, God knows how to check our motives. The next thing, the last thing is you got to learn the history and the vision of the organizational ministry church that you are being asked to help lead in. You can't lead without understanding the backdrop and the background, the sweat, blood, and tears of, of the, the forefathers, so to speak, uh, the, the uh, predecessors. And, and you need to cheat. You make sure you understand the vision so, so you're not out doing your own thing. And, and, and so you can uh, not only catch the vision, but uh, begin to transmit, transfer, and, and teach that vision as you are leading within the scope of this organization, or this church, or this ministry. It's not good enough just to see your place and your position and where you're going. You have to look at the, the whole picture of the, as far as how you fit in the bigger picture. And you have to make that bigger than you are and begin to communicate that more than your position and your stance and who you are and what you are. Because if you don't, if people just see you and they don't understand the bigger picture. So this is not about Charles Franklin Simpson, Jr. This is about Antioch, the apostolic church on the surface. And then it's about the church and the kingdom of God. It's not about me. It's about what God is doing in the church, through the church, worldwide, and the kingdom of God is bigger. And so Joshua, the Bible says that after Joshua and his generation died, another generation grew up that did not know the Lord. Joshua received the baton. He, he caught the vision, received the baton, but he failed to pass the baton to the next generation. He didn't find someone to lead after him. If you can uh, say that was uh, a, uh, a fault or find fault with Joshua's ministry, we know uh, where Moses, he struck the rock when he should have blessed it, sanctified it, spoke to it. You know, the rock was smitten once and didn't supposed to be uh, 
He wasn't supposed to be smitten twice or struck twice. And so uh, Joshua's error was he took a hold of the ministry. And his responsibility was to get the people into the promised land. But after the people got to the promised land, it, it didn't end. It wasn't supposed to end. They needed leadership to carry on the legacy. So when you get to the promised land, you get to that place, is there going to be someone that's leading and helping us to get through that time frame? And so he didn't pass the baton. He let it drop. And then there was a nation, a group of people, a generation, they didn't know the Lord. Don't, don't make sure the baton doesn't drop from your hands. Make sure you pass it on. I believe just as Joshua represented the uh, generation just before uh, the nation of Israel would become a nation, would uh, be a part or partake of the promises. It was a, it was, if you will, a, a uh, ingathering into the land. It was, if you will, a, a, the promise of us spending eternity with Jesus Christ. The promise, it entering into the promised place, okay, in the presence of God. And Joshua did not pass the baton to that next generation that entered into that place. And I believe that we are in the dispensation, uh, the time period, that, that, end, that end time period where we have to make sure that we pass the baton to this next generation, this last generation, I believe and feel, before all the promises of God come to fruition and come to the end. And so, again, don't drop the baton here, church. New saints in God, new believers, new followers, seasoned leaders, let's do our part. Learning how to lead, learning how to lead, not passing or dropping, I'm sorry, the baton, but learning to pass it on. Um, there are some, some questions you need to ask yourself as we uh, apply some questions, application questions in this. Number one, who in the church do I see potential in? Potential in. Who do I see potential in leading? Is there someone else I can pass something on to? Maybe there's someone who's not saved that I can teach what I know because I see something in him. I, them, I see God leading me to them and them being drawn to God. And I can... I can uh, teach them and, and lead them along the way so they can grow up and we can grow together. And do you see that person being able to carry on and pass on what you put in them to someone else? You know, Jesus ministered to the woman at the well. He knew for sure. <laughs> He full knew that, that this lady was going to go. And he said, where's your husband? She said, uh, I don't have one. He said, I know. You had five. And the person you're with is not your husband. And uh, he said, go, go, go get your husband. She said, well, I don't have. And then she went to go tell everybody in the village. And Jesus knew that. And they came and told, uh, they came to Jesus and said, hey, now we believe because we hear him and not just what you say. 
And so you can pass on. You, there's somebody out there that you can reach. Another question you want to ask, what can you start doing now to get them ready to start leading later? What can I do now to put into someone so they can start this process? And how can I make them greater than I am? No matter where you are right now, what can I do? Your whole idea should be investing in someone else. Investing in someone else. You know, that's how you are lifted up and elevated. Not that that's what you're looking for. But when you invest in others. I want to ask you leaders this. Who are you currently training? I want to ask everyone, who are you currently recruiting? Are you training anyone, recruiting anyone to take your place? Do you see yourself going anywhere in ministry? If you do see yourself going in other places in ministry, if you feel like, you know what, I'm called to do this, that, or the other, have you trained anyone to do what you're doing right now? And have you looked to encourage someone to do what you're doing now? If you hadn't, you, you're not really serious about going to that next place. Just something to think about. If you hadn't thought about all these, you need to start thinking about that. Applying this concept. Again, in closing, Paul made the statement. You need to, everything that I've taught you, everything that I, I've invested in you, everything that I've put in you, you need to commit this thing to faithful people. You, in other words, you need to find somebody that will be faithful, and you need to commit this to them. And they have a responsibility. You're going to make sure that they are able to teach others what you know, what I taught you, and what's been taught to me. It's been passed on. We've been passing this baton, and it's not going to drop with me. It's not going to drop with you, and it's going to pass on because this is the will and purpose of God. And the relay race is just about over. So church, don't drop the baton. Pass it on. Make sure we pass it on in Jesus' name. God bless you. I do want to communicate one last thing, and that is, again, on Sunday mornings, I'm going to be continuing and preaching unless God gives me something else. One morning, God gave me, uh, oh, I, oh, I just put it like this, I, as I was praying and seeking, seeking uh, after God and gave me 16 messages. <laughs> 16 messages in one morning, uh, topics, subjects to teach on. And uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to all prophetic type of uh, messages, when I say prophetic, or messages on uh, where we are now spiritually, where we are headed to, things that are about to come uh, on the face of the earth. And um, on Sunday nights, I'm going to be uh, ministering, preaching, or teaching ma mainly from the book of Revelation. If you've never learned or interested in learning, I didn't say I'm going to be teaching prophecy. I'm going to be teaching the book of Revelation. And, and when I say I, I'm teaching prophecy, a lot of times I'm not just looking at the book of Revelation. I'm looking at the, uh, the book of Daniel. We're looking at uh, other uh, books, uh, Ezekiel, um, Jeremiah, Isaiah, um, Zeph Zephaniah, Zechariah, uh, you know, some of the minor prophets of the book of Joel, and then obviously looking at the apostles, some of their prophetic uh, teachings, and obviously the book of Revelation as well, and uh, the conglomerate of uh, prophecy scriptures. We won't be doing that per se. Um, while I may quote from other uh, passages of scripture, the focus is going to be the book of Revelation on Sunday nights, 
and not uh, coming from a, well, this is the end of the world type of thing, but I really feel to, to do that and teach it from a different perspective and different, different uh, standpoint. So I'm not doing like the prophecy conference and, and teaching as we do on the, uh, the classes um, from that perspective. We're not doing it in, the, in that mode. So it's going to be a little different. It's going to be strictly teaching from the book of Revelation to give an understanding of the book of Revelation. And uh, on Thursdays, we're going to continue doing this, equipping uh, the saints in, in that mode. So praise God. Uh, that's, that they, they are the plans. And um, I pray this uh, service, this, this lesson was a blessing to you, um, that you've gotten something out of it. Prayerfully that you take this and apply this as this is the will and purpose of God for the day that we live in. Amen. That we are, God is trying to get his church out into the field. Um, and when this uh, situation, when this coronavirus deal uh, dies out to the degree where people are going to uh, be comfortable enough um, to gather, I believe there will be an explosion. Uh, initially, people may still be kind of skittish, and that's fine. But I believe that's going to be a great and effectual door open. Um, and we're going to have uh, different venues and methods and ways to minister to people. I spoke to someone earlier today, and I said when we go back to opening up these small groups, we're going to still have a lot of people who will join in on the small group right through Zoom. So we'll have the, the personal or uh, in-person small group with Zoom going at the same time and have all of it. And... Uh, you just never know how things are going to be. So I'm looking forward to that. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, I submit uh, this uh, lesson to you. I pray, God, that people would not just receive it as a, uh, a, a mental note, uh, that they would not just receive it mentally, um, that they would not just receive it intellectually um, and, and just through head knowledge. But I pray, Lord, that you would do a work in the spirit and that you would uh, uh, speak to people to make this a part of their life, uh, a part of their uh, purpose in you, that they would seek um, to commit to faithful people, that your word can carry on, your legacy can continue on, and that this ministry and work would carry through and to the rapture of the church. In Jesus' name, I give you praise, honor, and glory. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you real soon.